Hello, welcome to my session, Redesigning the Applied Phonology Course for a Virtual Classroom, Kinesthetic Activities to Enhance Learning. I'm Dr. Susan Spassini and Professor and Program Director of ESL Teacher Education at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. It is truly my pleasure to be back in Paraguay through this virtual conference and giving you this presentation. An overview of my presentation is that first I will share a timeline of converting our ESL master's program to fully online and more specifically the applied phonology course. Then I will explain how I will be exploring online teaching presence in the applied phonology course and the use of kinesthetic activities to enhance learning. During this presentation, I will describe my earlier experiences with teaching phonology. <clears throat> I will explain the conversion of our face-to-face -face ESL master's course to online. I will explain how virtual teaching is a community of inquiry. I will describe online at learning through actions and then how to incorporate didactic materials and kinesthetic activities into an online course. And finally, our implementation to date of this online course and our work in progress of the research regarding this course. Here are pictures of graduate students that we've had in the past. The upper right are three students who did the course, this phonology course and the program, totally face-to-face plus one student who was in South Dakota and attended the courses via an iPad. The courses were face-to-face, -face, but she was on an iPad, but it was not an online course. And in the bottom, we have one graduate student giving a presentation and her partner in this presentation was on the iPad or on the a laptop and uh, was attending via Zoom. And again, this was a face-to-face -face course but we had one student who was attending it from a distance. My earlier experience with teaching in phonology, it started in Asuncion in 1984 at the Universidad Nacional de Asuncion, Facultad de Filosofía, Instituto Superior de Lenguas. I taught phonology there almost every year from 1984 to 2002. The upper picture, the picture on the top has the students in my phonology course during the last year that I was teaching there. And these students were giving presentations. And right now one group had just, in this picture, had just finished their presentation and another group was going to the front. The bottom picture on the left is the Instituto de Superior de Lenguas. It's where it was housed in downtown Asuncion during the time that I was teaching. The right-hand column shows the University of Alabama at Birmingham I had began teaching phonology there in 2004. I'd arrived there, started working there in 2003, but 2004 was the first year I taught the course. And until 2019, this phonology course was taught face-to-face. -face. I'm still there, but I'm now teaching it online. Um, the ESL master's program is housed in the School of Education, the Department of Curriculum Instruction. The top picture is one of our classrooms and my phonology students are working in pairs. The pair that's in the front, there's one student that's face-to-face, -face, the other student who is on an iPad. Now this year in fall 2020, all pair work and group work was done online because of course now in 2020 is online. The bottom picture on the right is the nucleus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham it's 20, 100 square blocks. This is the center part of it, and it is a, a busy downtown street. At UIB, the ESL teacher education program started in around 2000 with the first graduate receiving a master's degree in 2002, and I arrived right after she graduated. In 2020, we reached a milestone that of 700 graduate students obtaining a master's degree or an educational specialist degree, which is 10 courses beyond the master's, both in ESL. 
So we're very proud of this milestone. And the University of Alabama at Birmingham is located in the Southeastern United States and is in an urban setting. Here's a semester by semester timeline of how we implemented our ESL courses to being online and the program, the master's degree program to being fully online. In January, 2019, we had, we were offering already one course that was fully online. However, that spring, our ESL faculty decided that as of August, 2020, all courses would need to be online. That's because the other ESL master's programs in the state were going online. Now the rest of our courses were blended and hybrid. So to take them from a blended hybrid delivery to online and to do that in over two years, we felt was very doable. In May, 2019, which was the start of our summer term, we had two courses that were fully online and the others were blended hybrid. In August, 2019 fall, we began converting more courses online. The first three that you saw there were, had been online for a while. So in fall or August, 2019, one, new, one course got converted online, the others were blended. January, 2020 was the beginning of a semester with a lot of change. Three courses started online that January, but by the middle of March when COVID hit and everything went online, the other four courses went online and some finished the semester, which ended in at the end of April online. In May, 2020, our program, the university still required all courses to be online. So six more courses went online. We had eight online courses. And then in August, 2020, we started the semester we're in right now. Two more courses went online. One of these was a phonology course we had waited for the end of this transition to online to convert phonology online because we felt it was the most difficult course to go online. So this semester we had seven online courses. So this is how we took a program that was almost entirely face-to-face -face or blended to then being fully online. With virtual teaching, we have a community of inquiry. In that community inquiry, has to include a cognitive presence, one of learning. That's the information that the students are learning and how they make it their own. But there must also be a social presence because as people, we learn in the presence of others and we learn by exchanging ideas with others. Therefore, online learning must include a social presence by the students and by the teacher. And then there has to be an instructor present. The instructor can't just mount everything onto an online platform and let it go. The instructor must be there present and interacting with the students. And the students interact with each other, with the instructor and with the community. So our question in converting these courses online, and especially my question when converting the phonology course online was how do we as teacher educators, when we are novice designers of online courses and also novice facilitators of virtual spaces, how do we develop our online teaching presence? And also, how do we as teacher educators incorporate kinesthetic activities to facilitate online learning? It's the second question that I will be sharing with you today. Online learning by doing actions. It sounds like something that, well, how do you do that? Well, we know that students will be viewing our lesson videos or our videoed lessons. Well, viewing isn't, action, isn't active, but we have to make sure or ask our students to please view these videos in a quiet space so that they can be pronouncing and acting and that they don't feel inhibited by other people watching them. And also that they're in a space where they can clearly hear the different sounds that we are sh um, sharing and that we are producing for them to produce after us. They need to be able to listen very carefully in order to distinguish phonemes that are very similar, such as the t and the z that might not exist in their own language, 
And therefore, how do they distinguish it? And how do they as future teachers help their students, their English learners to distinguish and produce these sounds? Consequently, I ask them when I'm teaching these videos to pronounce the sounds after me and the minimal pairs such as Sue, zoo, bus, buzz. This is just one of many examples. We then, I then ask them to use their hands to touch certain parts of their body to help them because since they can't necessarily hear the phonemes and distinguish them, maybe by touching and feeling that will help. So touch the vocal cords for the voicing such as zzz, which is different from sss. But sometimes touching the vocal cords is quite a challenge for certain learners especially for young children. So then right underneath the jawbone here, touch the throat area and go zzz, zzz, and it's stronger than at the vocal cords. Or they could press down on the head and go zzz, zzz. And that's even stronger because the head acts like a musical organ. And then have them do plug their ears. When they plug both ears together, they can actually perceive more vibration of the voicing than they can in any other way. So I'll do this right now, and I hope that you're doing this with me. Zzz, zzz. It's quite a difference. And then they begin, if they're not actually hearing it or perceiving it, they should be able to feel it. Then the other thing is, there is one time when touching the nose is very useful. Some speakers, such as speakers of certain dialects of Chinese, don't necessarily hear the difference between the L, the L sound, <clears throat> and the N, the N sound. So if you take your finger and plug your nose while you're doing L, nothing's going to change. So go L, the sound continued. But if you're doing the N, which is fully nasal, and you stop there from coming out of the nasal cavity, the sound will stop. N, so that usually makes it very interesting for language learners, especially the younger ones. Now, you could also ask them to hold up their hand with how many fingers, give them two options. Did they hear number one, su, or number two, zu? So they could hold up one finger to say they like the first option. That's what they think they heard, or they like the second option. This is faster having them show their fingers on the screen than it is having them go find the response on chat or some other feature on the computer. Now, they can also stretch out their hands for length, stretch out their arms for length, and also squat, stand, and jump, which I will be demonstrating in just a moment. The important thing here is for them to use all of their senses, and that's what I'm going to show in the next slide. Because they're hearing, it's hard for them to hear the distinct phonemes of the new language. We need to incorporate their other senses. And we can do that through didactic materials. First, they should always bring a mirror to your online lesson. Before they turn on the lesson, they should have the materials in front of them that you have indicated to them in advance of that lesson what they will need during your lesson. Don't say, well, if you don't have a mirror, stop right now and go get one. They need to know they're going to have it right there. Now, if they don't have a handheld mirror, they can always use their cell phone and look at the selfie image because on that image of the photo on the cell phone, they can see themselves. And we want them to see their mouth and their facial features, their cheeks, what if there's stress, um, tenseness here. Okay. If your lesson incorporates an uh, studying the articulator, which is the tongue. Ask them to bring a red sock to put it on and to show the tongue movement. If you're looking at the points of articulation, you might ask them to bring flat lollipops because they can take the lollipop and they can put it in their mouth and they can touch certain parts of the tongue or the cheeks or the lips. And by touching different parts of the tongue, they should be able to taste. Taste is one of the five sentences, senses. Oh, so that's what my tongue is doing. Or they can take a tongue depressor, which is used in the doctor's office, chopsticks from restaurants, Chinese um, stores, um, store, Asian stores, 
and they can then use the blunt end of the chopstick and reach in and touch the alveolar ridge, touch the velum, touch the different parts. You have to be careful though, but that's one way they can do it without putting their hand in. Um, if your lesson includes aspiration in advance, ask them to bring tissue, feather, pinwheel, candle. By using a candle to show how the flame will blow out if they're aspirating when they say pan, pan, can, and the candle should blow out. That doesn't happen with any Spanish words. So that helps them with aspiration. On the others with the tissue holding it up and it will move, the feather will move across the table, the pinwheel will move. So they're doing sight. So we can use sight and smell from the candle here. And on the back of the hand, it's also touching. If you're going to be demonstrating sounds that show length, long vowels, you could use a rubber band or a slinky or um, like holding out a fricative a little bit, stretching your arms apart. So all of these are didactic materials that get the different senses working so that they have a better chance of then understanding that there's a difference in the sound and they begin to hear. On this next slide, series of slides, I wanna show an example of using kinesthetic activities online for online classes in order to uh, learn English word stress and for your future teachers or current teachers of English to learn how to help their students, their English learners with word stress. As a review, stress is the prominence of a syllable. In English, syllables are longer, louder, and higher in pitch when they are carrying the heavy stress. In English, there are three levels of stress. All three can be seen or heard in the word photograph. The first syllable, pho, is the major stress. It can also be called strong stress, primary stress, or strongly stressed. The second syllable, t, the photograph, has no stress. Because there's no stress, in English, unstressed vowels go to schwa. So there you see the symbol for the schwa. And then there's a lack of stress, totally unstressed. So it kind of gets very short and kind of reduced. And the third syllable, graph, has minor stress. <clears throat> it's a medial, it's a called, also called medial stress, secondary stress, lightly stressed. So you go photograph. In Spanish, there are two levels of stress. A syllable is either stressed or it isn't. Because a Spanish speaker coming to English has to le learn three levels of stress, and because stress is often a little bit difficult to teach, it's and heard, difficult to perceive coming from a language that doesn't have three levels of stress, we use kinesthetic enactment of word stress. By doing this, the learners can feel the stress throughout their body and act it out, and then they have a better chance of hearing the stress different levels and pronouncing it. So for this first syllable, the major stress photograph, we use a jumping jack type of movement, sort of like from the physical education classes to demonstrate that it's loud, long and very high. So we're reaching up to show it has high pitch. Photograph. And the second syllable t, is unstressed. So we will squat down and I will disappear off the screen in doing this, squat down to a schwa position. That figure on the screen in dark gray, his body almost represents the shape of the schwa that we use from the IPA fonts. The third syllable is minor stress. It's like having a minor role in a movie or on a, in a film play. And we'll just stand just there not loud and doesn't disappear or almost disappear, just there. So the major stress can be looked at having the major role in a play and the minor stress can be like having the minor role in a play just standing there. And the schwa kind of disappears and gets out of our way. So now how are we going to do this? I will describe this slide and then I will act it out. So in English, major stress shifts to different syllables and not usually not in a very predictable way. You need, there's certain signals, but you, 
you can't really predict it when you're an English learner. So as you learn each word, you have to learn its stress pattern. So photograph starts off with the major stress, then goes unstressed, and the third syllable is standing, such as show, I showed on the previous slide. But if we go to photography, then I start off with the schwa. I go to a strong stress, major stress, jumping out, then to a schwa again, unstressed, and then standing still. And then photographic, the strong stress now is on the third syllable. I start with the minor stress standing, go down to the schwa, then I jump, and then I go down to the schwa. So right now I'm going to turn, stop sharing the screen to act it out a bit more. While I do this, it would be great if all of you could stand up, back away from your computer so you don't knock it down, and then we'll do this together. So I'm going to add back up where well, you can see me better. And so we'll do photograph together. Let me get just a little bit more down like this. Okay. And so we'll do photograph that's strong, jumping, then weak, squatting, and then standing. So we'll go photograph again, photograph. Okay, I shouldn't do that so much. And then we'll go to the next one, photography. So here I'm gonna start down, photography. Again, we start down squatting, photography. And the third one, photographic. We start with standing and then squatting and then jumping and then squatting. So photographic, so photographic, okay. So with that, let's go back. I'm gonna share the screen again. Here is the slide where we left off and where I did all three of these different stress patterns and so did you. So the implementation to date, where are we? Well, our virtual teaching presence, we videoed lessons, pre-recorded them, and each lesson had an average of 15 minutes in length. This is what is best practices when you do pre-recording. You don't want it to go real long. You got it. You're gonna save it. You're gonna use it again and again because certain elements, aspects don't change very much. So you can pre-record them. In addition to the pre-recorded videoed lessons that students are to watch, they also attended a weekly session and here the instructor touched base with them for that instructor presence. It was called Fun with Phonology. It was no more than 45 minutes and it was recorded. It was live. Students were invited to come, encouraged to come, but sometimes they just couldn't, so they watched it later. There are discussion boards among the students and these were monitored by the instructor. The instructor didn't usually participate. And then there was feedback on the written work. The instructor gave feedback in a timely manner. So that was the instructor presence. Now this kinesthetic learning, they were viewing videos and listening carefully. That wasn't the kinesthetic part, but it was an activity. And we encouraged them to do it in a quiet space, such as where I'm trying to do this video today. They were saying sounds and repeating the minimal pairs. They were touching parts of their body, as I demonstrated, that were involved in producing speech. They were using their five senses and didactic materials. They were moving their hands and arms and standing, squatting, and jumping. So there is kinesthetic learning. The work in progress for research, well, it's an ongoing study. It's our first ever online phonology course, and it ends on December 11th. So we've got a few more weeks to go. Our initial attempt seems to be meeting its goal. We will now explore what is happening and whether or not it is successful in support of student learning. There are multiple perspectives that we are seeking. Um, there are results from the, the results from the tests and coursework indicate that students are learning. There are anecdotal student comments and these are positive. We will formalize the gathering of student input after the course ends and we will also examine other data sources. These are the references that provide information about virtual learning 
and about the community of inquiry, as well as our kinesthetic approach. With that, I would like to thank you from here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'd like to thank you for having attended the presentation and I look forward to seeing you at the question and answer. Thank you.